welcome to Wine Library TV. I am your host, Gary Vay Nur Chuck, and this, my friends, is The Thunder Show, aka the internet's most passionate wine program in Mott. We are going to help the wallet today. Um, what I'm really excited about is a lot of people have been asking for value-driven shows. Uh, the CKCs have been yapping. They've been hitting me up on Facebook, emailing me. You know, they're relentless with this new media. I mean, no more smoke signals from the roof. They get to me quickly. And so I knew that I had to address under $10 wines. We've got four wines here that I have not had in the past, three of which I've had in prior vintages, one that I am reducing. Ridiculous, no, let's take it back, redonkulously excited about because I think Vino Verde is no longer your grandpappy's Vino Verde, so I want to talk about that. So today's show is really about the wallet, Mott, you know, trying to find wines that people can afford for school night wines. So many more people drinking Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights while they watch their favorite shows like Gossip Girl. I don't know if you guys caught the last episode, Mott, are you watching? Huge mistake. Anyway, before I get into that, Caesar Mancini, happy birthday. No, it was yesterday. Big shout out from Kristen for your birthday. I apologize, I missed that. And speaking of missing yesterday as well, it's a little bit of an off day yesterday, Mott. You know, from now on, if you want a birthday shout out, you're gonna have to email Mott. Mott, link it up. Dude, I can't, I can't. And you better get organized because you're worse than me. And you get like three emails a day. Anyway, happy 21st birthday to uh, Rachel from Jordan. Uh, you are now part of the club. You can drink the vinos. Come join us. Become part. Quick little short question of the day. Who has this? The original Vania wristband. The one that if you stretch it all, it completely falls apart. Just curious how many people out there are rocking it. Speaking about rocking it, Vino Verde and Portugal. I've been talking a lot, yapping, running my mouth even, about how Portugal is coming on the scene and delivering obnoxious value. And so what we're starting with today is the Andreas uh, 2006 Loriero, uh, which is a Vino Verde. The grape varietal is Loriero. And if you want to talk about a grape varietal that I'm almost guaranteeing that none of you have had, none of the 80,000 Vaniacs that are watching this episode, I would say less than 10 of you have ever had a straight 100% Loriero. And so my question is, another side question is, if you've had it, please answer because, I, and don't lie, that's really just not the way to go. Oh, quick little book update. We're gonna do this, Mod. I've got a new idea. We're gonna do the Amazon rank update every day. And today we're at 445, so it's not as good as 36 as we were. Yesterday we had a little bit of a push. We're in the 200s, so 445. We'll talk about it again tomorrow and see where we're at. It's going to be interesting. Phones are ringing, but don't worry. That never bothers the Thunder Show, Nikki. So anyway, 10 bones, 90 points, Mark Squires, who uh, runs a very famous wine forum board, which I was a member of back in 1999, which then got engulfed under the E. Robert Parker umbrella. So uh, big shout out to Mark. He does a great job. He's down in Philly, though I still hate the Sixers and the Flyers and the Eagles. My, you really hate the Eagles as a Giants fan. 12% alcohol, low. Summertime, it's getting warmer, everybody's getting excited, people wearing t-shirts, skirts are coming out, everybody's feeling goody-goody, and these are the kind of wines that I think a lot of people are gonna be interested in. I think we've gone through the revolution of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I think we've kinda made a little bit of push of Albarino in this country. You always see people talking about pink dry rosé. That's had its play. I think it's time this country focuses on Vino Verde and how serious they are. I started really understanding about six months ago when I started getting wines put across my table to purchase that were like $20 and were Vino Verdes. If you're like me, you grew up in an era where Vino Verde was like four bucks and had a little frizzante to it and there was really the one with the blue and white label that looked like a stamp and the green label one that had the people on it. I mean, that was it, that was the play. We're getting a big surge of new producers and uh, Andresa is one that got 90 points from Mark Squires who's been very conservative so far with his scoring so I'm awfully excited about seeing what this is going to bring. Let's get right into the color first. You know, light, nothing too crazy. Looks like your average Pinot Grigio Sauvignon Blanc color. I think this is probably a good time, uh, wouldn't you say, to pour a little bit out for all the Vaniacs that are missing this show. We miss you, come back. And now, let's get right into a snippy sniff. Some interesting minerality coming through on the nose right away, which I like quite a bit. There's a little bit of a hint of like passion fruit guava, a little tropical on the nose, which I like quite a bit. Maybe even a hint of like green leaves, you know, just good old fashioned green leaves. Cause I'm sure you walk by a tree and pull in, smell it, right? Right? 
Very pleasant aromatics, which is exciting. I'm always excited about the bouquet. I mean, one thing, if this is the first time you're watching or just starting to watch the Thunder Show, I'm very big on people smelling wines. Much, much more than I see. I mean, when we go out to restaurants, way too many people pop and pour and drink. Uh, The aromatics bring such a secondary dimension, plus really open up your taste buds, I believe, to, you know, finding more subtle little flavors. So please keep in mind, sniffy sniff your wine at home, kids. You know, kids that are 21 and older. Let's give it a whirl. Definitely light, um, you know, 12% alcohol. It's got a very obvious Granny Smith apple component right off the bop. Actually reminds me of, do you remember the green blow pop that was apple? Sort of really tastes like actually quite a bit. A little bit uncanny actually. Let me just try a little hit more. I wanna say apple steel, if that makes any sense. You know, it's definitely apple-y, clearly, obvious. But it's also got a really interesting aluminum, steely kind of thing going on. Um, It's got good acidity on the back end. Really would be interesting to have this with like a little lobster salad. Um, This is gonna lean towards shellfish. Um, I would love to pair this with oysters. West Coast, of course, throw up the dub. Uh, You know, Kumamoto's especially. I like the elegance, it's light, it's crisp, it's clean, it's simple, um, it's not crazy thought provoking. Clearly a porch wine, which I love, which means that you can easily just drink this by itself in your backyard while you're cooking up the barbecue or playing wiffle ball, frisbee, horseshoes, however you roll. Um, I'm not as crazy enthusiastic as Squires is on this wine. I'm gonna go 88 points. That makes me feel awfully good about this wine though. For 10 bones, this is extremely adequate, very textbook, um, definitely a different profile that I think will put your palate in a different direction and continues the process that I'm so passionate about which is getting you to try different things. And so for this kind of low price of entry to a totally different varietal from a different place, um, I'm excited about it. If it had a little bit more oomph and a little bit more complexity, it would be lights out, like James Tony. And if you know what that means, you're darn cool. Anyway, solid stuff, good start to the value show. Mott, I'm feeling good about that. Let's move on to evil. Look how they did this. You know, it's upside down. I mean, is it evil because you want to flip it over and you lose all your wine? Evil, Southeastern Australia, Cabernet, $8.50, 90 points, Jay Miller who is now reviewing for Robert Parker's wine advocate, the Australian wines, the Spanish wines, Washington State, Dr. J. Miller, as he's known, is a good, good dude, and I'm excited to see what happens here. 90 points, J. Miller, $8.50 on paper. This could be an obnoxious case by type wine. Great color, nice little start. Let's give it a sniffy sniff, my friends. You know, it's got the classic Aussie fake fruit smell and what I mean by that is it tastes, you know, it smells very artificial. It smells, you know, every one of us, if we've had real fresh squeezed orange juice compared to Tropicana, real apple juice that's been crushed from the apples compared to apple cider to like manufactured apple cider, we kind of understand where that artificialness comes from in a smell and a taste and so many of the Aussie wines have this yellow taily, you know, kind of thing going on on the nose. And what always baffles me is why would then I spend 12 bucks when I can get the same thing at Yellowtail or Alice White or Penfolds for five or six bones. So that always concerns me. On the nose there's a little black cherry, a little hint of cocoa, a little mocha mocha going on which is okay and kind of interesting. It's actually opening up a little bit stronger so off first sniff I kind of bashed on it. Maybe I judged the book by its cover a little too quickly. It is opening up a little bit. I do like the mocha, you know, almost like a hot chocolate powder thing going on. Remember hot chocolate with the mar- marshmallows? I always say mushrooms. The marshmallows, and they were so small. You were like, what is that? But then when you poured the milk, because I never used water. Come on, you used water. You cheated. I knew it. I see how I felt that? Anyway, they'd get bigger. You'd like that? Anyway, so it's got a little bit of that cocoa powder thing going on in the nose. I love how this label, this is pretty cool. Look what it says. It's just wrong. Let's give it a whirl.
<laughs> I'm starting to think that I might know what they meant by putting it's just wrong on the back of the label. So, I'm not feeling this wine. Um, it's got a very heavy green spinach component on the mid palate to the finish, which is normally a characteristic I love, right? I love the veggies. What I don't like is the heat of the alcohol, which I'd love to see, 15%. And to be very honest with you, the quality of this fruit just can't contain it. You know, it's just like, you know how like sometimes people wear outfits that they shouldn't? It's a little tighter than you needed to go there, lady. That's what I feel about with this wine. The fruit is unable to contain the alcohol, so it's bursting out of the seams. Um, very awkward, completely disjointed. Uh, the flavors are very simplistic, and really, honestly, tastes like a jug wine. Uh, I really love the packaging. I love the marketing behind it. I'm an obnoxious fan of the Grateful Par Palette, who I see imports this wine. I think Dan Phillips is a marketing and wine genius. Um, I'm a big fan of Dr. J. Miller, but I'm going completely against the grain on this wine. I'm gonna take a complete number off the front and go 80 points on this effort and give it a major Paz. Let's throw up eight Zs, P-A, Z, 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 Z. Yeah, Paz, do not go here. I just think there's so many options in Australia to waste your money under $8.50 that you have the sea of them. Whichever one you want, folks, go into any supermarket. They're all gonna taste just as good or bad or evil or just wrong like this wine. Let's move on. That sucked. Um, I'm excited about this wine. I've had this wine plenty of times in the past. I feel like I've drank this every vintage. I think it's also a very widely available wine from Yecla, Spain. This is the Castano 2006 Montestral. Um, this wine rolls in at seven US dollars. I know you're paying 950 in the city, but that's how it goes. 90 points, Josh Reynolds, the guy who writes the Australian reviews for Stephen Tanzer's International Wine Cellar. A lot of peeps hiring, different peeps, maybe Maybe I should bring on different hosts for different areas in the world. This way I can vacation and fish and do other things. Um, let's see what's going on here. Seven Bones is, you know, an obviously very attractive price point for a wine if you roll into a store that you see has a 90 point score on it from a respectable critic like Josh Reynolds, who I'm a pretty big fan of, have had dinners with and think is good, good people and has a great palate. So I'm excited about this on paper. Uh, let's give this wine a sniffy sniff. The color's actually a little bit lighter than I remember it in the past. You can actually see your fingers through it. A new phenomenon in the wine industry, thank God. Sniffy sniff. Some subtle cherries. I really like the kick of black pepper right off the yin-yang, so that's exciting. There's also like a vegetal kind of thing going on that I'm kind of liking. Actually, no, it's more like... Huh. It's kind of like, um... Where am I going with this? What's that thing at the sushi restaurants? Um... Sea, what is the thing? Um, thank you. Seaweed. This has a seaweed kind of soy sauce kind of thing going on. On the tail on the nose with black pepper, it's kind of pretty exotic and kind of interesting. Um, and it's kind of obvious. I like it. It's interesting. It's definitely um, oh, a big blast of basil too. Yeah, that's what it is. A little basil, oregano kind of like you know, not cilantro. Anyway, let's give it a whirl. Very dry, which is, a, I think, a turn on for a lot of wine drinkers. A lot of people really like dry red wines. It's definitely that. Um, it definitely has a nice little subtle cherry, strawberry kind of. Remember Capri Sun? Uh, those things were cool. <laughs> I used to love those things. Um, it's got a little cherry Capri Sun thing going on. That used to always freak me out. It was the first cherry juice I ever had that was completely clear. I was like, well, how do they do that? Um, but it's basic, it's a, little, it's a little awkward. The tannins are definitely too high. I think this could benefit from decanting two or three hours, so that's something to keep in mind. This soy sauce seaweed thing going on 
It's pretty clever and neat. It just finishes so bitter and tannic. And I just can't see people without food really getting involved with this or some serious decanting. It's solid. I don't hate it. I definitely don't love it. I'm gonna go 84 points in this wine and also give it a pass. I just think that there's better alternatives out there in the Spanish category under 10 bucks. There's a lot of neat little 86, 87, 88 type point wines on my palate. Remember, forget about what I'm scoring, what I think. It always comes down to what you think. I think these wines are widely available, so I expect a lot of different opinions in the forum. But, um, you know, again, my library of taste, you know, I'm the fortunate one that gets to taste hundreds and hundreds of different wines. So where I position this is, you know, an 84 point wine, I, I just think the finish is difficult. And ultimately, that is what you remember last. And so no matter how great a movie is, if it doesn't finish great, it's a problem. I'm talking to you, Platoon. All right, let's move on. Finally, Taha. I feel like saying Miguel Tejada. Did you hear about Miguel Tejada, the baseball player? Just came out and said he was two years older than he was. I love that. Wait till you get the 50 million and then tell the truth. Taha, 2003, Reserva from Humilla uh, in Spain, an area that's really rock and rolling. You know the Clio and all those things that have done so well. 14% alcohol content. This wine rolls in at nine US dollars, 90 points wine spectator. 50% Montestral, which is Mavedra, uh, 20% Cabernet, 20% Tempranillo, and 10% Merlot. Uh, this is owned by Mahler Bess, which is the company that also owns Chateau Palmer, which is a very special and respected and $200 a bottle Margot from the Bordeaux region. So big family behind this project. Nine bones, 90 points wine spectator. Humia, great little area. On paper, pretty exciting wine. So are all of them. We're one for two. Let's see if we can go to 500 and go to the Hall of Fame or go, actually one for four, that's 250, not horrible. Um, nice little color. Pour a little too much. Let's give it a little bit of a sniffy sniff. There we go. So, okay, from the three red wines, clearly the champion on the nose really just smells good. Do, do you kind of know what I mean by that? I mean, it's got a really beautiful dark chocolate raspberry jam component blowing through the nose. But there's also a lot of little subtleties in this wine. Um, I get a little tiny hint of like mint, so there's a little grasshopper kind of thing going on, or a little Andes candy because you know you've got the chocolate and the minty thing going on. Maybe a hint of paprika. There's also a little bit of a goji berry component. The other day I did something awesome. I finally got goji berry like jam instead of just the goji berries. It really helped me get down the aromatics. And this is the first wine I've come across since then. It was a couple months ago. That really comes through. So almost a goji berry. If you haven't had any, they're uh, coming on strong from China, like everything else. Uh, let's give it a whirl. There we go, red wines. I knew something would have to come through. Taha, I love you. Um, polished, elegant, real. Something these two wines really have to ask themselves. Are you really being you, or are you just dressing up and acting cool for the other kids in school? This wine knows its DNA, is complex, is rich, has balance. Again, a key component to so many wines. I love the elegance, the transition on the mid palate from this beef jerky gamey kind of thing that this wine has to a lot more fruit as it tails off and then it has a silkiness component. I'm still tasting the wine as I babble and that makes me excited. Um, really well done. I know what it is. On the tail end, there's a gorgeous tobacco component. This is what eating cigars does for you kids. I really know what I'm talking about in this, and I like it. Black cassis coming through, little Kiyoshi Royale on the finish. Just a really well-made wine. Not the biggest wine I've ever had, and for Humia, there's so many over-the-top, ripe, explosive, way too overdone wines. It's nice to have a wine like this that has a little more balance. The influence from the Bordeaux family is clearly obvious in this wine. Without even knowing that, it would have been obvious to me that that it is influenced by that part of the world. I'm really appreciating this wine because I find it very polished for a $10 price point. Something, nine, 
it's not, you know, with the euro and the dollar where it's at, this is exceptional. I couldn't even imagine even Steven would be talking about a $6 wine. Um, it really proves that if you want to make really good wine at a really affordable price, you still can. What really draws me to this wine is the fact that I feel I can pair it with a lot of things. Not only do I feel I can pair it with also Busco and, and meats and steak, but I also feel that this wine has the elegance and the body structure to really even pair with some fish, a red wine that crosses over, and, and that's kind of exciting for me. This is a wine that's absolutely worthwhile to seek out, um, something that I really think will bring some thunder into your world, and I, I'm really impressed with it. So clearly, the Taha, and the Andresa dominated the day. The Castano, you know, is a wine I think some people could like, but I just, you know, just finishes it. And the evil was evil. Um, question of the day. What is the last best under $10 wine you've had? Lurkers, I need you to come out. You're watching my show for free and you're not commenting and it's hurting my feelings. Because you, with a little bit of me, we're changing the wine world, whether they like it or not.